What I want to pursue today, I will get back to this in the future, what I want to do today is to generate a disturbance in a medium which has an infinite number of coupled oscillators, which is a string, to generate in there. So I take a string and I wiggle the end and then I want to evaluate with you what's going to happen. And so for this I need some assistance from someone, Nicole, would you mind? Just hold this firmly in your hand. Now most of you may think that this is a spring with a P as in Peter, but no, it is a string with a T as in Tom. You will see that. I'm going to use this as a string. I'm going to put tension on it, T, which is what we needed also for the n-coupled oscillators. And the amount of mass that we have, we express that normally in terms of the mass per unit length. Remember, in the other case, we had little m divided by L. Well, we call that now mu. So that's how much mass per unit length we have. And what I want to do now is just shake my hand, and then you tell me what you see. You ready? There we go. Are you ready, Nicole? What did you see? Just tell me what you see right after I do this. What did you see right after I did this? The disturbance moved. That's number one that we have to understand. Why does it move? Now, look what happens at Nicole's side. I generate a pulse which is like this. I'll call that a mountain for now. And only look at the moment that the mountain reaches her and something comes back at me. And then stop looking because things begin to wander back and forth. And tell me what comes back at me. So I'm going to send a mountain to Nicole. What came back at me? A valley. Now I'm going to send a valley to Nicole. What do you think is coming back? Very good. It's hard, to, it's actually, you know that it, I don't know why it is. It's very hard to, to generate a valley. Let me, let me do a mountain again. This is a mountain that comes back as a valley, and I'll try a valley. Okay, I'll try to do a valley, so I go down and up. Yeah, that was a good one. And you saw that, <laughs> yeah. Well, because of you, it worked. Thank you very much. You did a great job. So now we have to understand two things, and that is why does it propagate, and why does a mountain come back as a valley, and why does a valley come back as a mountain? Continuous medium, infinite number of coupled oscillators. I start here with a piece of that rope. Let's call this position X. And I call this position x plus delta x. I call this y. I call this angle theta plus delta theta. And I call this angle theta. We have a tension t on the line and mu is the mass per unit length. So you tell me what the mass per one meter is, and I know what mu is. It's the length, the mass per unit length. Well, if our displacements are not absurdly high, then we can make the same assumption that we made with the beaded string, that the tension is the same on both sides. It's an approximation, but for modest amplitudes, it's a very reasonable approximation. So we have a T here, and we have a T there, and they are then, to decent, to a reasonable approximation, the same. Just like with the beats, for modest amplitudes, we don't have to worry about motion in the X direction. The only thing that matters is the motion in 
the y direction. So I will concentrate exclusively on the motion in this direction which drives it back to equilibrium. And so f of y on this segment is then minus t sine theta because this component is down minus t sine theta plus t sine theta plus delta theta because this component in the y direction is driving it away from equilibrium but for small angles and we have to have small angles otherwise all our assumptions are wrong t's are not the same so for small angles the sine of theta is the same as theta in radians and so this becomes a theta this becomes theta plus delta theta and so this thing becomes t delta theta that's an approximation for small angles now I will apply Newton's second law the amount of mass that is in here is dm and I will calculate shortly what dm is it's a little bit of mass we're going to make dx go to zero infinitesimally small amount of mass and so that mass times y double dot must now be this force that we just calculated there must be t delta theta but what is dm well we know that the length of the string is delta x so dm must be delta x times mu because mu is the amount of mass per unit length and if my length is delta x then dm is mu delta x so I can write this now as delta x times mu times y double dot equals t times delta theta we're getting there now since we're in the limiting case we're going to make delta x zero the tangent of theta so that's becoming then this direction the tangent of theta is dy dx right that is dy dx and the reason why I use partial derivatives is that I think of it as the time not changing at any moment in time this is dy dx that's the only justification for the partial derivatives I take the derivative on this side and on this side in x so the left side I take d tangent theta dx and I do it on the right side now the derivative of the tangent of theta of the function is 1 over the cosine squared of theta that can take you more than 20 seconds to confirm that you can do that in many different ways so this is the derivative of the function itself and then of course I have to multiply it by d theta dx because I take the whole function derivative in, in, in dx and so here I get then d2y dx squared but for small angle approximation cosine square of theta is 1 and so I'm going to substitute now this result into my differential equation I read this as delta theta which is here and I read this in my mind as delta x which is here now mathematicians would probably never do that but physicists have no problems with that so I'm going to write now here mu times delta x and here I write d2y dt squared I use partial derivatives because I'm not changing x that's the justification for the partials and now I get t and now this delta theta I'm going to write for it this times delta x so now you get delta x times d2y dx squared and now I'm doing something that mathematicians would never do I'm going to divide out delta x 
don't tell your 18 or whatever people that I did that. So now what you have is that mu divided by t times d2y dt squared, constant value of x, is now d2y dx squared. And believe it or not, that this is a big moment in our life. You have here a differential equation of y, which is a function of x and t, well, by here you take the double derivative in time, and here you take the double, double derivative in space, in location. What is a possible solution to this differential equation? You can just see it by looking at it. You immediately see what the solution must be. Any function, any single valued function, you can come up with any one, I don't care with which one, any single valued function of x plus or minus a constant times t will satisfy this differential equation. Just look at it. You can see immediately that it works. Take the second derivative in time, you get a c square out and you get the second derivative of the function. Take the seventh, second derivative in x, you only get the second derivative of the function, and that's all. So all it requires is that c is the square root of t divided by mu. Then, I bet you a month's salary that any single valued function will satisfy this differential equation. What is the dimension of that c? What is the dimension of that c? meters per second. It's a velocity. Because if I have apples here, I must also have apples there. And so this can only be an apple if C has the dimension of a velocity. So therefore, you might as well write this as plus or minus VT, and you might as well write V for here, a velocity, and we might as well change now this differential equation in a way more in a way more uniform way, which is what I'm going to do now, which is one over v squared times d2y dt squared equals d2y dx squared. And this equation is what is generally called the wave equation. It will be with us until the end of the course until death do us part. It is really a big moment because you're going to see this equation many times for many different systems, but now you have seen it being derived for this very specific case. Let's now evaluate the meaning of that V. Well, if I have a here x and here y, and I pick just a function, it could be a sine, it could be a cosine, I pick one that is way more imaginative. I pick this one. That's my function. It has to be single valued, though. You have to be careful. It must be single valued. You cannot go back. That's my function. And so that's my function f at time t equals zero. Let us take for v always a positive number for simplicity. I'm going to call it even speed. Speed is always positive, right? And I want to know now, if I look a little later in time when there is a minus sign here, what that function looks like. So at t equals zero, I gave it to you. What would it look like a little bit later in time, if there is a minus sign there? Any suggestions? The function has shifted in what direction? Use your hands. Who thinks it's in this direction? Who thinks it's in this direction? 
Very good. 